Go ahead. All right. Hi, everyone. My name is Dr. Geraldine Davis, and I'm happy to have you here for our session today. Today, we are concentrating on creating an inclusive culture at your organization and where to start. Six months ago, SIA decided to embark on a six-month training focusing on inclusion. And the participants of that inclusion training involved their executive committee, which I have here with me today. So I have Wendy, Wendy Carey with Sirius, as well as Eric Tung with FARA, who is the, uh, who's the president of FARA, as well as Chris Licata, who is the president and CEO of Technica Group North America, and Dino Dardano, uh, the president of HESTRA, and well as Wendy being the CFO and VP. So we are so excited to have you here because we wanted to convey a very authentic, holistic perspective to creating inclusion. And ideally we wanted to create a perspective where everyone sees that inclusion is a journey and that there are varied perspectives that entail this inclusive journey. So we want to start with understanding what made you decide to embark on your inclusion journey? And I want to start with you, Wendy. Oh, boy. Um, so, you know, as we're all so aware of the events of 2020 and, um, and COVID, I think, really facilitated the beginnings of this in that it, it it really shut us down. It stopped us in our tracks and it gave us time to, um, it forced us to question a lot of, of our space and our environment. And, and then George Floyd happened, which was nothing really new, but in this space where we had all stopped and we're asking ourselves and our environment, what's going on, it, it really brought the opportunity for us, I think, to face in a way that we hadn't faced before where we were and what was happening in, in our planet, in our, in our um, countries, in the US, in, in our industry and in ourselves. Mm -hmm. and, um, and in this space, um, when I think about it, what, what is the best resource that we have for change? And it really is, human resources. Mm -hmm. And that is the connections that we all have. And it seems to me like the connections that have been broken with ourselves and with each other, it's what have caused all these different issues to, to arise, including environmental impacts. And um, so when this opportunity and this focus on inclusion and um, and how we were leaving people out of the conversation, how we were not recognizing the dig dignity and equality of each other, and how we weren't really coming from a heart space first about things. Inclusion seemed like, like just the logical, perfect way to go to begin to address issues that, that could solve this. So I, I'm grateful to be part of this um, journey and, and learning more about how I individually respond to things and then being able to spread it out in our company and beyond. That's awesome. Yeah, I love that you mentioned this idea of learning and how it really just has allowed us to challenge our frame of thought and really concentrate on like, how am I viewing the world and how am I engaging with the world? I know, Eric, you've been really diligent in your efforts as far as like really just expanding your own frame of thought. Can you kind of talk through what, what that experience has been like for you? Well, sure. Um, you know, I'm thrilled to be part of this this exec com um, process uh, of inclusion. And as Wendy kind of touched on, it's really been a period of reflection, I think, for everybody on a number of topics. Um, but inclusion in particular, you know, led me to reflect on my own experience, you know, as a member of more than one kind of minority group. Um, you know, it, it had me go back and think, like, what was that like? What was it? What was my own experience, my own journey? Um, overcoming certain biases or certain preconceived notions. What is it like to be the other in a, in a given conversation or industry or, or topic? Um, and so uh, it's been a great opportunity to reflect on that experience. It's been a great opportunity to reflect on the experience of our company and our brand. Um, you know, my mother founded our business as a minority immigrant female in a very um, male dominated industry. And it's something that I didn't really fully grasp uh, until we kind of went through this experience. And um, it's led to some great conversations. What was her experience like? Um, you know, feeling like a relative outsider in the industry 
And, you know, I think it still translates. I mean, um, it, it's not always intentional, but sometimes we just kind of go about our, our day and go about our motions and um, momentum leads us down a path where we're like, wait, we kind of like left some people out here, you know, or we might not be incorporating um, people, points of view, thoughts that maybe we should. Um, and so what's been great about this experience um, beyond kind of reflecting is just um, realizing that, you know, I think so many of us are really in the right headspace for opening up um, and for rethinking how things are done. As Wendy mentioned, COVID has been a real game changer for everybody um, and forced us out of kind of old frameworks. Um, but the great experience that we've had here on, on, on ExecCom um, on this in this process is just seeing that as soon as you open the door to the conversation and you're willing to kind of expose yourself and let people in and, and let yourself be seen, um, there's a tremendous amount of, of support. Um, there are tremendous opportunities um, and plenty of resources. So uh, it's been a really positive experience um, for me and I think for the whole group here. Um, and, uh, and I'm looking forward to our continued work to make inclusion a, a, a more integral part of our industry and our business. Yeah, I think, it's, I think it's phenomenal that you mentioned this idea of making it an integral part of your business. And I know Chris, you've been very intentional about ensuring that Technica Group has embedded in its strategy, its marketing as well as operations and its financials. What has been your, what has been your experience with, with creating that type of impact? Well, um, thanks for the question. I, I think it first started by um, what, what many, Wendy mentioned um, in the spring following uh, the murder of George Floyd. And, and it certainly wasn't uh, the first of its kind, um, but it was extraordinary in a way that enraged a nation. Um, it really tipped the scale and it forced all of us as people and certainly as organizations to consider where we stand on the issue of uh, not only racial justice, but justice for all marginalized people. And before we started putting in place any plans to create change within our organization, um, the challenge for me, quite honestly, was to find my voice um, on the topic. I certainly knew where I stood, um, but whether it was making a statement at home to my kids or whether it was making a statement to our company or on behalf of SIA, trying to make a statement to the industry, um, before anything happened, I needed to get comfortable with being uncomfortable around this topic. And I took a bit of time. Um, it was about a week after everybody was issuing statements of proclamation about how they were planning on addressing the, the, the racial injustice in our country. Um, the first step to answer your question was, uh, I did find my voice and I, um, I made an unequivocal in print and in, in, in and, uh, in presentation, an unequivocal statement that our company uh, won't tolerate racism or bigotry in any form, and sort of posed this question um, to the company of, you know, what really our role is in creating, supporting, and sustaining change. And it was sort of this challenge for us. And so, following the the, the statement that I made, um, uh, I also communicated that I was planning on starting within our company. Um, a working group to really start to understand this topic more deeply um, with complete vulnerability and, and humility that I, I did not know. This was really in earnest my first step, and but I was um, I was committed to, to, to making progress and being a part of the change. And I opened the topic up to the company, uh, whether you shared my views or not, to start to do this work. And I was quickly met with so much enthusiasm by people um, that approached me after the presentation or emailed me right after saying, this is so important to me, I wanna be a part of it. And so we created um, a working group that is affectionately referred to as the, the most favorite meeting of the week. We meet on a weekly basis. Um, but, um, but what we were able to do is establish a, a regular meeting rhythm. Um, but the, one of the first things we did, and this is going back to uh, July and August, is we created uh, a working group charter, um, what we were trying to do. And that took a month or two to really work through. Um, we call ourselves the IDEA team, which is inclusion, diversity, equity, and action, because we want it to be focused on action. But we created a charter 
Um, we also created uh, a DEI statement that we communicated to our company and to anybody that interacts with our company. So they, need, they know quite clearly whether they're an athlete that represents us or a, uh, or a rep or a subcontractor of some form, where, where we stand on it. We, we um, have engaged throughout the duration of 2021 um, outside uh, professional uh, inclusion training for all of, our, all of our company, knowing full well that, again, not everybody shares my view. Um, and that's important to include those. And then we did, we're doing some tactical things, reviewing our holiday schedule. For example, Martin Luther King holiday wasn't on our, Martin Luther King Day wasn't on our national holiday schedule. It now is, we changed Columbus Day to Indigenous Peoples Day. We added two floating holidays and are building a framework for people being out of the office focused around uh, inclusion within our community uh, as an example and a whole host of other things. And, you know, the, the one thing that I would say is throughout this process, it sounds like we've done a lot and I'm proud of the work that we've done, mm -hmm. but man, it is a messy business. And um, it's part of the thing that's, it's never done um, mm -hmm. and it's uncomfortable, but, um, uh, but it's so gratifying and energizing the work. And so, um, so yeah, it's been, it's been incredibly exciting and, uh, and, and humbling. That's amazing. I think what I, what I found most profound with your statement and with some of the experience that you've had is that it, it isn't never done. I mean, I think even people have come to me and was like, well, you know, well, what do we need to do? And when is it done? I'm like, I've been doing this for 16 years and it's still not done and I'm still working through it. And I'm still finding ways to include people and ensure that people feel like they're respected and there's a mutual belonging. And that's really the heart of inclusion is ensuring that that voice is there, but it's never done. But I think that's the fun part. I don't actually want it to be done. <laughs> like it's exhilarating and it's challenging and character building as I like to call it, but it's well worth it. So that's amazing that, that you had that perspective. And I think what you were very intentional about is conveying that you started with where you were. And Dino, I love your story as well because you're very organic in where you are in your inclusion journey. Can you kind of share what it means to start where you are and, and kind of share your experience. Yeah, you know, with uh, Wendy and Chris's encouragement and inspiration, uh, you know, we've decided to implement a similar program starting in March uh, within our company. And, uh, you know, as I thought through the process uh, about how this is going to come together, I really think you got to look fundamentally at the structure of your company and the different departments and how they're integrated and how they're inclusive. And uh, we got some work to do there. Um, I guess the most encouraging thing for me personally was sharing my thoughts of putting this committee together with my management team and how open and receptive they were to, you know, similar to Chris's uh, team there. So we're anxious to get started. Obviously we got a lot of heavy lifting to do with the selling season yet, but um, I'm happy to be heading down an inclusive path uh, for our company, not only for, you know, the immediate future, but long-term and putting some policies in place that uh, will support inclusion in our hiring practices and, and in other aspects of our company. Uh, Chris mentioned vendors, right? Um, I think it, it is important for a company to have a statement and what we believe in and who we want to do business with. So I'm um, looking forward to the challenge and uh, happy to be a part of the team. Yeah. That's amazing. And I think that even what you're talking about is the, that short term goals as well as long term. So creating this this uh, intricate process will where it projects and, and feeds into to the remainder of your success of your organization, I think is really profound. Um, and you even mentioned talking about the inclusive culture and how even some of your departments are, not you know, connected to each other. And how can we create that type of inclusive culture to prepare for that is amazing. That's fantastic. And Wendy, I know you've mentioned a lot about just Sirius's efforts to, you know, being somewhat of a diverse company already. Um, what has been some of the efforts that you've taken as far as, you know, being able to create more inclusivity in your organization from where you are? Yeah, you're, you're right. We, um, I mean, there's, there's some obvious diversity. If you look at, um, at Mike Carey, our, one of our founding partners and, um, a few other faces that are that are often associated with our company, but behind the scenes, we have just as much, if not more, diversity, and um, we have quite a, a huge Filipino population as part of our staff, as well as Laotian and Southeast Asian that um, 
came over after the Vietnam conflict and, or during the Vietnam conflict and Middle Eastern. But anyway, it's um, as we kind of looked at this, we, we thought more purposefully about how we are engaging the various voices. And we're fortunate in having a very heartfelt, dedicated team. Mm -hmm. But it was in creating a methodology of um, really understanding that this was at the heart of our principles and understanding that within and without too, because we, we haven't really talked publicly about who we are. We just, we just were. And mm -hmm. with this, I think came the, the indication that, that there is something that we can offer just in terms of our own journey and how we approach that. So we, we have embarked upon a, a purpose mission and that mission has become a very inclusive um, arena for our company in that the people who are on the the central committee of that we we asked for volunteers much similar to what chris did in their company and we got people from all different levels and positions within the company and um, no man, well, I think there's, there might be one or two um, department managers who are on it, but everybody else is just, you know, somebody in the company who said, ooh, 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 yeah, yeah, I want to be there. And then hearing the input and hearing their development of the, of an articulation and a communication about what CIRRUS stands for and, and what they want CIRRUS to stand for also mm -hmm. and, and how we, what we prioritize within that list of so many different things that that we want to be around environment and equity and um, oh man, the list goes on. But it's mm -hmm. it's been really uh, just an amazingly gratifying experience to hear more of those voices and to look forward to how that grows to Dino's and Chris's point about um, it never ends, you know? Uh, it, it just, this is, this is a growth project that will go on forever, you know? Like, far after I'm out of the picture. And that, that's the best part about, about all of this. Yeah, and if I could just add to Wendy's point, because I, I completely agree, you know, one of the things that, that we're finding, one of the benefits, like all, uh, I'd say, functional committees is, you know, there's sort of no hierarchy and um, collaboration. It's sort of this idea of collaboration versus expertise. We all acknowledge that we're very early in this process. And so collaboration is much more powerful in this context than resonant expertise. And that's where I think the energy comes from because we're all sort of starting from similar similar places. Yeah. I think what's, what you mentioned, Chris, as well as Wendy, is that this idea that you are concentrating on allowing them to be engaged. So even if you're thinking about organizational cultures, there's a buy-in that happens when they're a part of the process, when they're able to say that they have vested stake and vested interest in the success of it because it's theirs. You know, they have some ownership. And so that most definitely creates a bit of a shift. But I know in reference to even Dino and Eric, I know we talked about, you know, right now you're not hiring or anything along those lines, but what are some things that you've been able to do to prepare to create that inclusive workplace culture, even though you're not hiring? Because I know some of the idea is like, well, we just need to bring more diverse people into and the culture. But, uh, you know, if you're not hiring, what else, what else can you do? Well, I mean, I go back to just engaging in the conversation. Um, you know, starting last year, we, uh, you know, with our small team made a, um, a you know, a decision, <clears throat> a decision to um, be more inclusive or uh, representative in how we were presenting our brand. Um, and, you know, we are a small brand, we don't do a ton of marketing, but, you know, in scouting talent for our photo shoot campaigns, um, in uh, canvassing the landscape for partner collaborations on um, the marketing side, mm -hmm. uh, I basically said, I want color, you know, I want range. And, um, and again, opening, like kind of starting with that, you know, opens the door to all these new sorts of conversations. People are, you know, the people that we've reached out to have been so pleased and so, um, so moved by being contacted and by being, you know, in, you know, engaged and be, by being given the opportunity. Um, and it's, um, it's just really nice to see. And, you know, through those connections, you have even deeper conversations about, you know, how did you, what was your experience getting involved in this sport? How did you learn to ski or snowboard? 
what has been your experience at the mountain, you and your friends, you know, um, it's that kind of, you know, it's, it's education, right? I mean, you know, we are constantly, constantly learning and, um, you know, feeding our brains. And I think this is just, uh, it's like a, a new, it's like learning a new subject in college, you know, um, you get to go deep and you get to have a lot of cool conversations and um, your mind is just sort of turned on. So, um, you know, one good thing begets another good thing. Um, and so we've found that with the partner relationships that we've been forming, um, whether it's on the marketing side or, you know, vendor partnerships, um, that sort of thing, you find yourself approaching the relationship differently um, and with a different point of view. Um, and it's, it's great. It's really refreshing. Yeah, I think it's been cool because you and I, first of all, we use our strengths. We're very much so information <laughs> based individuals. And so we've been able to bounce things off of each other and articles and information. And, you know, I'm always eager when I see Eric pop up on my Instagram. I'm like, oh, what did Eric send me? <laughs> and you connected me to, to you connected me to Mount Noir. And I was like, oh, wow, I didn't know about Mount Noir. So it's like when we are able to create this ecosystem of sharing information, right. you know, we are we, we get connected and collaborative and it doesn't seem as daunting as it could be. Yeah. For sure. Not, not you know, only, oh, go ahead, Wendy. Yeah. Not only is it daunting, but, um, you know, the few people have talked about collaboration and, and meeting new people. And, and that I think is, one of the, the really powerful things that, that we've been experiencing is getting better connected to groups within, within our community, within our, our snow sports community that have been there for a long time, like um, National Brotherhood, 1950s. But you know how connected have we all been? And so by connecting with these activist groups and groups that have been there for so long and just not received the um, opportunities to be involved more mm -hmm. deeply within the industry, I think when, once we get deeper into that connection between all of us, then the power that we all have moving forward to solve so many other problems is, is it, that's what's really energizing for me is what we can do when we all get facing the same direction. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I think even what you mentioned as far as like being able to tap into each other's strengths. Um, I know we all have varied strengths and, you know, within the training, there was a strength-based approach. Um, I want to talk to you, Dino. How were you able to use your strength to, to help get yourself on the path? Because I, I kind of know your strengths. So how have you been able to use them? <laughs> I'm a problem solver. <laughs> I, you know, I think for me, you know, the first step was really identifying, um, you know, for instance, our hiring practices and, and how we've done that in the past, you know, it was always about finding the best person for the job, right? And uh, it was a very finite amount of time. And mm -hmm. having worked in, with the group now, you know, we're going to take a different tactic. And that is really taking more time to mm -hmm. interview more candidates and really work towards building a diverse team here at Hescra, not just the best person for the job, but also some diversity uh, within our company. And uh, so that's, you know, one of my goals as we start this uh, project and, and move forward. But, you know, I will say personally for me, um, I had a lot of angst in, in the beginning, even talking about this subject. And now I feel fairly confident in having conversations with my peers, my family members, uh, friends about uh, inclusion and diversity. And, uh, you know, it's kind of interesting because, you uh, you don't always hear what you want to hear. And it really can change, shed a different light on relationships and things like that. If there was one hurdle that I've experienced through this process, it's not everybody thinks the same as I do. <laughs> and, and that's been insightful. You know, you, you really have to take that into consideration. So it's, again, been a great process for me personally and hopefully professionally in, in the short term here and long term, we're going to see a major shift in, in what I, how I feel, how I think about inclusion and diversity and, and at a company level as well. That's awesome. Yeah. I think when we're able to, as we're continuing to engage in the conversation, engage the conversation, engage the conversation on inclusion, it really can develop into be a new normal. I think we've talked about this idea of just really 
creating a daily habit of looking for inclusive moments and finding ways to be more inclusive and expanding your frame of thought. So as we've talked through this process, what has been some of the challenges that, um, and I know, Dino, you mentioned some of the challenges cool. and the angst. What other challenges have, have there been as far as like engaging in more of an inclusive behaviors? What have been some challenges that you've, you've had to face? Anyone um, like to share? Uh, yeah, again, you know, I think, you know, it's just the perspective that, you know, some of my friends in, in close circle of, of friends, you know, what their perspective is, uh, inclusion and diversity or, or how little they care about it and how it's not important to them. Um, you know, I want to work to change that and, and, you know, open their eyes to the world we live in. I think, you know, going back to George Floyd and, and the Black Lives Movement, I, I, I was just taken back that in, in 2020, this is still all happening in, in our country. I feel like we went backwards 10 years. It was back in the 60s. And that really inspired me to get more education, be a part of this group and learn more about inclusion. And that's what I would say to anybody that's on the fence. You know, you gotta dive in. You gotta take the, the leap of faith, if you will, and I think everybody would be surprised that once you do, um, people open up and, you know, they may have a difference of opinion, but you're having that conversation and you're beginning to move down that inclusive path. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Wendy, did you have anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, it's, I, I think that that's such a, you, Dino hits the nail on the head. It's, it's developing this ability within ourselves to really listen to someone else and really be able to understand where their perspective is and where it's coming from, what their experience is, whether, whether it's something that we can identify with or not is, is another thing, but just developing that ability to really hear what they're saying. And within that, I, I think you just create this energetic space of of the person feeling accepted on some level because they're being listened to. They're not being told they're wrong or they're different or whatever. They're, you're giving them at least the dignity of being heard. And, and I think that if we can start there and create connections there, it's sort of like with families, you know, we, we don't always get along. We don't always think the, thing, think the same, but we, we definitely feel that connection that we have. We're, we're family. And if we can, if we can um, get ourselves to that point, and, and I'm, I'm as guilty as anybody, it's hard for me to really listen openly to somebody without kind of picking, you know, where I see the opportunity for change or, you know, whatever it is, you know, whether, whether I'm right or wrong, it, it isn't the point. It's, it's me being able to open up and really hear what you're saying. And that, that's something I'm, I'll be working on for a long time, I'm afraid, but, but yeah, that, that hits, that hits it on the head for me. Yeah. yeah. The word that comes to mind for me, you know, the challenge of this is, is finding humility, you know, finding humility in others and finding humility in yourself. You know, part of it is trying to maybe get an opposing point of view to listen to you, but also turning the lens on yourself and being able to listen and understand like, where are they coming from? What is, what experience has led them to have the, the perception that they have now? Um, and how can we, you know, how can we meet somewhere? You know, I mean, we're, we're all on a spectrum. So how do we, how can we kind of let go on both sides and, and find common ground? Um, but yeah, I think, you know, I think finding humility, you know, internally and externally has been, uh, has been the challenge here. Yeah, the metaphor we use um, with our idea team is um, that we've communicated to the company is the goal is to set as big a table as possible um, and that everybody's welcome at it. Um, because it's clear whether it's within our company or it's never been more clear in our country lately that there are a lot of opposing views. And I think um, the minute that you become, you transition from being, you know, that flirting with the line of being right and being righteous, as soon as you um, draw a line in the sand and, and dig your heels in, you've lost the other, the other, the other folks. So it's this idea of, that we use is, is, um, setting as big a table as possible. And also one of the challenges is that um, I, I think about, I'm getting more and more comfortable with it, but um, when we started this journey at our company this summer, 
you know, it was sort of recognizing that me, what I do for work, I am um, a 50 something year old white heterosexual male of some might say of privilege and I'm inciting these conversations around, um, you know, equality and inclusion and, and it's getting comfortable with being uncomfortable with, you know, who I am, but my conviction to uh, creating change again, whether it's within my family or with our company or within the industry. And so I, I've struggled personally with, with the optics of that, despite the fact that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm deeply committed to, to playing my part in creating change. Yeah. You mentioned a good point about being comfortable with being uncomfortable. It's almost as if you have to really truly ground yourself. And Eric, I love that you talked about this idea of having in a sense, having humility, but also having empathy and compassion for yourself. Like we've all been on this journey we've all made mistakes. We've all had shortcomings and we're all still here. You know, we're still striving. We're still trying to be better and making uh, better adjustments. And Wendy, I love that you talked about this idea of really expanding interpersonal capacities. I mean, the more, the bigger the table gets, the more interpersonal skills you need and the more you kind of have to dig deep and, and challenge yourself in that way. And so as we're talking through this and we're, we're thinking of people that are questioning, like, how do I get on the path? What does that look like? What do you recommend for them to do? Like, what recommendations do you have for those who are still trying to figure it out? And, you know, and even some, for those who are doing extremely well, but maybe don't want to say too much because they don't want to be shamed or anything of those things of, of, along those lines, what recommendations do you have for those? All one of us, <laughs> talk to one of us, reach out to one of us. Um, obviously, SI is going to be, um, has been, you know, engaged in this conversation. We'll be continuing to provide more and more resources over time. But, you know, talk to, talk to someone, talk to one of us. You know, we're happy to, to engage in that conversation. And um, because we, you know, where we are now is, is quite different from where we started six months ago. Um, so, it does take some work and some commitment, but it's not, you know, it's not, it's not hard. It's not, you know, impossible. It's, it just takes opening the door. And, and to Chris's point, I think too, it's um, each of us have a, a voice that we can give and the, the power of um, Chris and, and others who are white, male, heterosexual, you know, of privilege getting involved. I think getting involved, that's what's making this change seem to be really sustainable and, and much more effective than it's ever been before is that the inclusiveness of the voices around this desire for change and this push to action for change is so different than it's been before. And, you know, I've read several things that have reinforced that idea too, that it's no longer just activists, traditional activists in a certain space. It's, it's everybody coming together and going, whoa, there's a lot of things we need to address. And can we all be part of this no matter how uncomfortable we might feel about it, that, that heartfelt intention to create change just feels so good. And I think the, the other, as I was thinking about, you know, what, what advice, it's like, take this as, a, as an adventure. You know, we're in a sport that is all about adventure. And this is an adventure. It's not about being judged or shamed or whatever. It's, it's like, wow, here's an opportunity to learn and, and move and discover spaces that, that a lot of us have never been in before. And it, it can be really gratifying. Yeah, I think one of the things too is is, um, is acknowledging that first first of all, it's the moral and ethical thing to do to pursue this path, like full stop. But there's an urgency because going down this road is absolutely essential for our industry and for our business. I mean, if you look at the demographic shifts and what the population is going to look like before we get to 2050, it's going to be less than 50 percent. White, it's going to be minority. Minorities currently will be in the majority, yeah. and if you if you juxtapose that with the skiing population, it's largely the same. And over time, over the next few decades, the real casualty in that is going to be the younger skiers. And I think about how a lot of us got started in the sport, skiing with our parents, starting early, which is why it's become a lifelong sport. Um, 
So it's really important that we lean into this more, a more inclusive, more diverse focus for our business. And, and the last thing that I would say is um, one of the stats that I found really remarkable was um, that by 2025, 75% of the global workforce is going to be made up of millennials. And millennials, these are going to be the future leaders of our companies. And they really care about this. And if we have a role as leaders to attract and retain the best and brightest, um, we need to be paying attention to this. So there's the transactional benefit of making sure we're um, appealing to a more diverse group, but there's an absolute essential component to make sure that we're building our organizations with people uh, of quality and character. And those people really care about, about this among other, uh, among other topics. So there's a business imperative, not just an ethical imperative. Yeah, yeah. It's almost this idea of when you focus on the qualitative and really expanding beyond your frame of thought, you start to see the benefits. You start seeing that, oh, okay, I can collaborate. I have access to talent that I didn't have prior to before. I have access to perspectives and ideas. And you start to see how expansive things can really be when it comes to your business. And really, I, I continue to reemphasize this, but inclusion is nothing more than expansion. It's expanding beyond your frame of thought and connecting to others. And as we continue to progress on this, I can't, I can't send kudos enough to SIA for their effort and their due diligence. I mean, I recall meeting them a year ago at OR, to be honest, and the Wendy and you know, I feel like everyone's became like a second family. <laughs> like I, I feel weird when I don't talk to Maria and Nick. I know that sounds awkward, but I do. And I'm like, where are they? I haven't talked to them because we've been so ingrained with working through this effort and to see everyone just grow and evolve is so, is really profound. And there's some exciting things that SI is still doing, you know? I mean, they're still making this, like this is a part of the business model now. And it's so exciting. And I think, Wendy, you know some of the details as far as like some, some activities as well as some town halls that are coming coming up down the pipeline. If you'd be willing to share that, that'd be great. Absolutely. It, it's been um, part of the purpose of, of the XCON coming together under this inclusion training journey has been to um, help inform and, and um, advise on what SIA can offer to the membership who is asking these questions. You know, what, what can we do? How can we, how do we address um, creating change within our organizations? So to that end, there is um, this launch of a, of a series of town halls, which will address different aspects of inclusion and the inclusion journey and, and how companies and individuals can best address it on many different aspects, marketing, yeah. um, a variety of different subjects. As well, starting around the 1st of February, there will be a, an inclusion playbook that will be available on SIA's site to members. Um, and all of this information you can always access through snowsports.org on the inclusion tab. So that's a great resource, but the playbook will, will really help go through a step-by-step -step process of where you begin with um, examining yourself and creating an intention around inclusivity mm -hmm. and then very practical steps for how, how you can approach this. And as Eric said, yeah, any one of us are always happy to discuss, you know, um, however we can be supportive of that. We're all in this together and we want nothing but, but the best for everybody. And to Chris's point about the, the business reason to do this, it's we have struggled for so many years to create stronger participation in our sport. And there are so many people who would love to find ways to be more involved in the sport from an entrepreneurial standpoint, from a participant standpoint. So opening up this up in a much more inclusive and, and welcoming way will be beneficial for us all psychologically, emotionally, and practically on the, on the business side. Yeah. No, that's amazing. I think what's so cool is that SIA has normalized inclusion. I mean, they've created this platform where you see inclusion on a regular basis, if you go to uh, SIA's website and look under their inclusion tab, I mean, there's a plethora of just tools and resources, information. You know, if you're even interested in going through the sword inclusion system, there's a self-guided version as well on the website. We're actually at we're at session 17, so there's a few more to go because there's 24 sessions. So you can have the replica 
of what XCOM has experienced. And, you know, what's so great is that this has now become a behavioral shift and everyone's evolved in more inclusive efforts. So it's amazing to see and witness. And, you know, I can most definitely see the future looking mighty bright for the snow sports industry. So as we conclude, I wanna thank everyone, Wendy, Eric, Dino, Chris, you know, it's been, it's been truly a pleasure to be engaged with you all throughout this process. And I've grown, we've all grown. It's, it's been truly invigorating. And so I invite everyone to partake in the inclusion journey in your own way, whatever works best for you, but it's most definitely worth it. So. I'll go ahead and sign off and I wish everyone an amazing year, 2021 into the new year. And uh, I look forward to seeing you soon. As, Have a as, great day. As oh. we sign off, I'd like to give a quick yeah. shout out to, um, we've been focusing on SIA and what SIA is doing in this, but, but there have been other um, portions of the uh, other organizations within the winter outdoors, the PSIA and NSAA who are participating in this inclusion journey also. And, and they are just as committed as SIA is to creating this change. So, um, you know, anybody in the audience who, who feels more, um, has closer relationships there, just know that, that they are part of this journey too and understanding and working towards this. So it, that's one of the best parts. It's not just SIA, it's all these organizations that yeah. have recognized this and it gives us all great encouraging feelings about truly creating change. Yeah. Oh, yes. That's in NSAA as well as Outdoor Industry Association. They've been a part of the training as well. So we've created this bit of an inclusion, inclusion ecosystem, <laughs> which is really cool. Thank you so much for adding that on, Wendy. Fantastic. Well, thank you, everyone. It's It's been a pleasure and uh, talk to you soon. Thank you, Dr. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.